We're in the chapter of the book of Hebrews this morning, and I'm very happy to be able to return to our study in that book. I have just so enjoyed. It's been a year we've been uh, going through this book. It, it was understandable. There's so much there, a great deal there for us, and there will be a great deal more for you. I hope you will take and read through this book at least uh, once or twice a year, and let the Lord speak to you concerning our great Savior, our great faith, and the uh, very solemn warnings that this book contains. Uh, it, you know, sometimes uh, you need a little warning every now and then. I kind of like it when the weatherman says, yeah, there might be some ice out there that you don't see, so uh, be warned. Be looking for that stuff. I like a good warning like that that helps me, uh, gives me a heads up, uh, a pay attention. Uh, and, uh, and the warnings in the book of Hebrews not only tell us, hey, there's danger out there, but it tells us to flee to him who is our refuge, who is our strength. Isn't it wonderful to know that today, it doesn't really matter what's going on in the world that we live. It doesn't really matter because God works all things according to the counsel of his will. And today we're gonna to talk about living by faith. Now you would think that something as simple as living by faith would be understood by everyone that calls themselves a follower of Jesus. But I think that um, we are carnal. We are born carnal, fleshly. We are bent toward the earth. And I think that part of our soulishness wants to gravitate back to what it's comfortable with. You know, the Bible teaches that the opposite of faith is not necessarily unbelief. The opposite of faith Look at it in context. The Bible says the just shall live by faith and not by sight. Now our soul wants to gravitate toward what we can see, hear, taste, uh, touch, and smell. We like to be able to relate to it in a very physical way. But the Bible says we are in touch with heavenly things. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. The heavenly spirit of God has come to dwell in this earthly tabernacle that is my body. My body is a walking, talking temple of the living God. And so the Bible multiple times from the Old Testament throughout the New says the just shall live by faith. Living by faith says, I, I so appreciated Brother Lee's message this morning. It's one of the best Sunday school lessons I have ever sat in. I enjoyed it so greatly. And the idea that God can be trusted. And those who choose to trust him, remember, it's not a matter of your circumstances. It's not a matter of how you feel. It's a matter of whether or not you decide God can be trusted. Think about all the decisions you made this week, all the times you sort of hedged your bet carnally, selfishly, when we could have stood out. What pleases God? We're not even in the, in the 11th chapter of Hebrews yet. We'll, Lord willing, move there next week. One of the most important cornerstones of the book of Hebrews says that uh, without faith, it is impossible to please God because to come to God we've got to believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him if you wanted an additional definition for what it means to live by faith it is to recognize that he actually rewards those who seek him I want us to live by faith. And the writer of Hebrews wants us to live by faith. And the spirit and the bride say, we need to live by faith. But the question is today, am I living by faith or by sight? Where is your ultimate confidence? In your 401k? What is it that says on the currency of the America? It says uh, on the good faith and credit of the United States of America. 
brother, I stopped having uh, faith in the, the, the credit of the United States. Do you, know how, do you know how deeply in debt this nation is today? We are four times as deep in debt as we were 20 years ago, maybe five times. And we are, <laughs> we're getting bigger shovels and digging deeper holes of debt. Don't put your trust in the nations of this world. It's right to love your country. It's right to be a good citizen. But it is wrong to put your trust in anything that you can see, hear, taste, touch, or smell. Because you see, it's the invisible things of God. You know, when Paul the Apostle writes in 2 Corinthians, he says, that which you can perceive, that which you can see, is that which you can't see is eternal, can never be shaken. Now ask yourself this question. How have I lived this week? Have I lived this week by sight, what I can put my hand on, or have I lived this week putting my entire trust in the one whom I cannot see. You know, faith is the substance of those things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. And we as believers, you say, oh, but preacher, I believed in Jesus. Thank God you did. Thank God you stepped over the threshold and you crossed over from the realm of the dead into the realm of the living. You crossed over from the realm of darkness into the realm of light. You crossed over from the realm of being fatherless, enemies of God, strangers from the covenants of promise to being a people, a nation, The Bible says, not that the just lived by faith, faith, but it speaks in that continuous present tense, the just shall live by faith. My text today is in Romans, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 30 and read through verse 39. And I want to I want to talk about sections of this. I don't know today, but uh, we certainly want to make a good beginning to try to understand what it means to live by faith. Live by faith. First, verse thirty. I'm going to jump in the middle of a context here. For we know him that has said, "Vengeance belongs to me; I will recompense," says the Lord. And again. The Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, he's coming off of a very important warning, one of those major warnings in the book of Hebrews. But now he's going to pick it up, and he's going to be talking to the people of faith, and he's going to say, we're not the ones that went that way. We're not the ones that are going that way. We are the ones who are going to choose to live by faith. He says, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated. You were illuminated. You see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But do you understand that faith does not come unless the word of God is illuminated in your life? How many of you know the difference? You were at a point in your life where somebody said, read the Bible. You started to read the Bible and you said, it is so much scary stuff and dry wheat straw, I don't understand it. That was me. But as that word began to affect me, as the Holy Spirit began to illuminate it to me, I began to see. You see, faith is not just something you muster up within yourself. There are those that think, well, if I hear enough arguments, I will be intellectually convinced, therefore I will believe. Faith has very little to do with my intellectual crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Faith has everything to do with a personal 
knock on the door from God. A personal shining of the light upon my soul by God. Let me tell you, the work of God is entirely supernatural. And if I respond to him, willing to hear his call, accept his invitation, respond to his instruction, then something supernatural happens within me. This business of, of having faith requires the initiative of the heavenly and the holy God. May I tell you some good news? The heavenly and the holy God has taken the initiative. God has taken the first step from the very beginning in creating the human race and loving the human race and providing a way that the human race can be restored from its fallen condition. God has taken the first step. God has taken the initiative. Jesus said, no one can come unto me. No one can come unto me except the Father Draw him to me. And so as the writer of Hebrews says, call to remembrance in those days after you were illuminated. Don't lose that. Don't miss that. Because that was the beginning of the adventure. That was the beginning of the relationship. If you responded to it. I saw a video of a young soldier walking into some dress shop and he had somebody behind him carrying the camera, you know. And he walked up to his girlfriend, handed her a cup of coffee. I guess he was in the habit of doing that on her break every day. He loved her very much. And then he pulled out of his pocket a, a little box. It was a ring box. And then he got down on one knee and he held it up to her and he said, would you be my bride? God has taken the initiative. Jesus Christ has gone to the cross and purchased our redemption, gave literally himself that we might become his bride. And he comes to us humbly. Those are not my words. Those are his words. He said, I am me and lowly in heart. And he knocks on the door. He doesn't shove the door down. Jesus could speak the door out of existence if he wanted to. But he comes as a man humbly asks a woman to be his bride. And he says, I'm at the door and I'm knocking. If you'll hear my voice, if you'll respond to this illumination, if you'll hear my voice and you open the door. We have to open the door. We have to. This is what faith does. Faith says, I'm not going to stand here with a door between me and him. I hear his goodness. I hear his mercy. I want his goodness. I want his mercy. I open the door. And Jesus said, you do that. I will come in. How many of you know that he keeps his word? You might know that. He keeps his word. He comes in. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Let me read on. After you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the downside. You know, Jesus said, you want to follow me? Well, it's not going to be easy. Let's read on. <clears throat> Partly, what kind of afflictions? Partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion on me. This is the writer of Hebrews saying this. You had compassion on me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. You were willing to be generous for my need knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. You see, there's where the faith comes in. Do you put your trust in your reliance upon your hope in what you see or what can be laid up where you can't see it? When I was a young man, I was encouraged to open a 401k. Now, 
It is not wrong to be a good manager of your finances and to prepare for the future. I think that a father that has kids, uh, especially, or, or has a wife in the first place, uh, should prepare some way, life insurance, or have some kind of a plan where he's putting away money in case something happens to him. See, you know, we're, we're betting against the absolute inevitable. Did you know that everybody dies? Did you know everybody dies? It's appointed unto man wants to die, period. There's an appointment. And so it's good to provide for those you love as much as you can. And when I was younger, we, were, we had a large family, and I was approaching, well, you know, if you only put away so many dollars a week, you can save up and you can do this. And uh, I didn't because I didn't. <laughs> I was trying to find ways to keep gas in the gas tank and tools for my work. And, you know, you remember how that was when the times were so tight that, uh, you know, the idea of a, of a retirement plan, brother, if I should live that long, maybe I'll have some money to invest then, but I can't do it now. I got a family to feed. And they keep growing out of those shoes and they keep needing all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, like books and, and oh well. So as a young man, I just couldn't see the value in what I couldn't see. I could see my immediate needs. And being young and foolish, and really at that time not having a whole lot of resources. By the way, that was a time in my life when I kept quibbling over God about my tithe. Well, God, you know, a tithe is after taxes, right? I was being so cheap. I was quibbling with God over pennies. By the way, my finances dramatically changed the week. And I said, God, you get the first slice no matter what. As a matter of fact, you are not only going to get the first slice, but I am never going to give you less than 10% the rest of my life. I'm going to make sure I'm going to go over 10% or I am, or I am missing my point. And you know what? I'm not boasting in me. I'm boasting in the faithfulness of God. I want to tell you something. My financial picture changed that week. I'm not rolling in dough, but I have never had my electric be, uh, turned off again. I have always had gas money. I've always had the means that I needed. Not everything I wanted. Able to help my kids get through college, able to uh, provide in, in, in every way that I could uh, see. To. I want you to know, part of my short-sightedness is I wasn't living by faith in the first place. I was quibbling with God over pennies. When I finally settled that, I began to do what the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good, that you can't outgive God. I don't know why I want to point that out, but I, I guess uh, except to say I finally learned, don't be so short-sighted. Now here's my point. At a certain point in life, I realized, oh yeah, my kids are grown. They have families of their own but I still need to take care of my wife. And I either need to put away some money into one of these, what do they call them, uh, life insurance policies, because, I mean, you know, it's kind of statistically proven. The guy goes first. I don't want to leave her stranded. And so I found out that among Southern Baptists, you can invest, the church can help you, put a few dollars every month in this fund, and, and look at there. By the time if you live to be 85 or 90, there'll be a little bit there to, if, when you kick off to take care of your wife. That's a good thing. Now, get my point. Paul the Apostle is saying, you, you, you came to the place that you would trust in what you couldn't see. Uh, you, what you couldn't see. When I was young, I couldn't see the value of a retirement program. Now, again, I'm not putting my trust in it. But I can see better than I did as a young man, I can see that even though, I mean, when you think of a 401k, you think, I don't see that. I don't touch that. That's set aside. You pay a penalty if you touch that thing. You can't touch it. And I realized at a certain point in life, okay, so I can't see it. I'm going to invest in it. I'm going to try to be wise. I'm going to do, try to do the right thing. My, my bottom line is this. You and I think, that, well, we are here in the nasty now and now. God will take care of us in the sweet by and by. But Jesus on several occasions said, 
lay up your treasure in heaven. Don't lay it up on earth. Now, you know what his disclaimer was? If you lay it up on earth, even that 401k that's a, 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 earthly speaking, it's a fairly good idea, uh, but it's not, it's not a sure thing. Matter of fact, the, the new administration could come through and we could have such inflation that whatever dollars are in the account, they'll be worth a fourth of what they were when you put them in there. It can happen. It's happened under the Carter administration. You remember when interest rates were 18 and 19 a percent a month? Woo, man. Some of y'all shaking your head saying, woo, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> those were tough. Yeah, I'm not picking on Carter. I'm just saying those were tough times. But you see, he says, if you lay up your treasure on earth, moths will eat it. I got a brand new, beautiful suit, nice suit of clothes. Most of those real nice suits are either made of wool or silk. This was made of wool. Did you know that moths do not eat wool? Did you know that? But moth larvae eat wool. And one of those little boogers laid some eggs on that suit right there on the lapel. And they hatched. They were good, healthy moths. And those little larvae couldn't even see them. They're so tiny. But they left a real interesting art pattern in the middle of that brand new suit. That suit wasn't six months old. Most suits I own are 15 and 20 years old. And uh, for, for, for a brand new suit to get uh, corrupted by a moth, boy, that got my attention. And it brought that scripture home. He says, if you lay up stuff on earth, moths will corrupt it. Rust will corrupt it. Brother Billy likes Fords. But the ones that he really likes, he keeps inside. Am I right? You keep them dry. <laughs> Because, and, and, and they, you know, even Jay Leno, can't, even in his air-conditioned garage, he can't keep them from rusting. You've got to stay after it, you see. And if moths and rust don't get it, if fire doesn't get it, well, guess what? Somebody's going to bust into your uh, little shed and going to take your favorite tools, going to take your favorite stuff. And so Jesus is just saying, why invest in something that's probably going to go away? And by the way, if it doesn't go away, you are going to go away. You're going to have to say bye-bye to everything in this earth except those people that you've led to Christ. You get to take them with you. I hope you'll come back tonight at 6 o'clock. Now you say, oh, preacher, I've been through all those classes on evangelism. I don't need to go through another one. Well, you just illustrated the fact that you sure do need to. Because you see, if there's anything in the church that's always moving downhill, there's two things in churches that are always going down, giving and evangelism. And you wonder why preachers are always talking about giving. They're always talking about evangelism. It's because the flesh is against it. It's definitely against it. And people will always resist it, and they will always fail in those areas. Just a moment of complete honesty. We are not reaching our community, our state, our nation, or our world. We're not. So if evangelism is the primary purpose for the church, then I think Miss Heather, as a registered nurse, you have to go in for, what do they call them, continuing education units. Now, you know what? I'm glad she does that. Because when you're in a hospital and you're knocked out by some anesthesiologist, you want somebody looking after you that's been doing their homework so that their most important job, as far as you are concerned, they've studied up on it. And it's fresh. And you know what? When you go to those, those classes, you hear stuff you've already heard, don't you? Now, they introduce some new medicines and new procedures, and that's good. Now, you know, in the way of evangelism, there's nothing new under the sun. There's no new gospel message. Matter of fact, somebody brings a new gospel message, run away from them. Let them be a curse because there is no other gospel message. Paul said in Galatians, anybody brings you another gospel, anathema maranatha. 
Let him be cursed. The Lord is coming. There's one gospel. But the problem is you and I get lazy. And what happens when we get lazy? We lose touch. Now, I know if you learn how to ride a bike, you can always ride a bike. But I used to ride a bike standing on the seat, not holding the handlebars and all those kind of things. Well, I want you to know I haven't been stride a bike in a long time. If I get on a bicycle, I'm going to be holding both handlebars, and I will not be standing on the seat, you see. You've got to keep it fresh. I hope you'll be back tonight and keep it fresh because evangelism is the main work for the main church, for the main age in which we live. We live in one age. and This is our business. This is what we should be doing. Jesus could have told us, go build nice buildings, have nurseries and kindergartens and have ball fields. And he said, he could have said, have a, a good English classes. I'm going to be teaching a Haitian family this week. I'm trying to help them learn how to speak English. He could have said, do all these things, but he never mentioned those things one time. He didn't say anything about baseball teams. He didn't say anything about church suppers. He said, you go. You make disciples of every nation. And you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you teach them everything I've commanded you. And he said, I'll be with you. I'll help you do it. But this is the whole work of the whole church, of the whole church age. Evangelism is very important. I have trade off the subject twice, so I better get back to it. Let's finish reading. Paul said, after you were enlightened, verse 33, you were made a gazing stock. They openly made fun of you by reproaches and afflictions and partly why you became companions of them that were so used. You were willing to love those other Christians that were being persecuted too. For you had compassion on me and my bonds and you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence which has a great recompense of reward. We'll explain that in a minute if we have time. If we don't, we'll do it next week. For it, you have need of patience, endurance, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. And we'll, 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 we'll address that. Let's finish reading. Now the just, shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul, this is God speaking, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now there's a word of encouragement that closes the chapter and I appreciate him putting it there. It sort of puts a new light on the entire chapter after that terrible warning that preceded it. He said, but we are not. That is the collective we, those who really love God, those who really want to live by faith, those who might have been messing up, might have getting lazy, might have been falling away a little bit to the side, but they're going to come back. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. There's two kinds of people in the world. There will be two kinds of people in eternity because they will decide in this world which one they are going to be. There are those who are going to respond to God's initiative. Those who are going to respond to God's invitation. Those who are going to respond to God's enlightenment. When God personally opens their understanding, shows them that they're a sinner, shows them that Jesus is the only answer, they will either choose to believe him they will choose to double down on their denial and say, I'm not a sinner. I don't need God. There is no God. Blah, blah, blah. Any lie. Pick any of those that you want to. There are those who will choose to live by faith, and there will be those who refuse to live by faith. Can I, can I take you back just a little bit in the chapter? Go back to verse 25, and uh, we want to get the context on that because we need to remember this. It is extremely important that we go out and try to find those people who will choose to live by faith. 
But do you understand that it's even our job to go to those who refuse to live by faith and give them an opportunity? God is so incredibly patient. God is so filled with mercy. He knows the hearts of men and women. He knows the past, the present, and the future. He knows those who will believe. He knows those who will not believe. But when I read the first chapter of the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus Christ is the light that lights every man having come, in, having come into the world. He lights everybody. Lights, L-I-G-H-T-S, enlightens he calls to, speaks to, makes his presence known and felt to every man, woman, and child that's capable of responding to it. I believe fully that those who are uh, infants and uh, inf early mortality and those who never come to the place of, of moral accountability, he's got them covered. Why? Because he's full of mercy. But everyone who, who has the ability to make a choice, he will go to every, every one of them. Remember this. Some of your neighbors, some of your coworkers, some of your family members, you would rather take a beating than go to them and try one more time to witness to them. I have relatives, they may be listening to me now. I have relatives that change the subject quicker than a frog can snatch a fly. Don't want to hear it? Talk to the hand. Not interested. Let's talk about something, anything else. But I love them. And God loves them. And there are some people that go to their deathbed. Not many, but there are a few I remember one Sunday morning, we were in Sunday school, and Miss Sarah called me and said, Preacher, you need to come. This man is on his bed dying. He wants to talk to you, a preacher. I said, i got to preach in a little while, but I'll give him what i got. I went to his bedside, and I talked with him, and I shared the gospel with him. And then I had to come back and preach that Sunday morning. Miss Sarah said, before he died early that afternoon, he prayed with her. He prayed to receive Christ. I want you to know there are a few on their deathbed who will turn to Christ. And so it's worthwhile. You know, the Coast Guard arrives on the scene sometimes after everybody has perished. And it goes from a rescue mission to a recovery mission. But sometimes the Coast Guard gets out there at the very last minute before that one goes down for the last time and it's still a rescue mission and they're plucked from the waters and they're carried to health and life again. And it is just the richness of God's mercy that would put up with the hardness of a soul to save them at the last minute. Don't count on it. Don't count on it because people generally die by what they live by. And if you put off God most of your life, you will probably die putting God off. God wants everyone to hear the gospel. But, and here's the warning. Go back to verse 24. I think it puts the whole context of living by faith into a, a different perspective. That's why the Holy Spirit inspired it this way. He tells us in verse 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Look, it's important. Get together. The church needs one another. Uh, exhorting one another. So much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, he's going he's gonna to go into a little section here where he says, those that won't come stand a good chance of getting more and more hardened and they won't hear. Listen to me. Did you know a good church, a healthy church, is a church in which there are lots of people who are not saved? Listen to me. We need in our pews people who are hungover, people who are coming down from last night's drug high, we need people in this church who are homosexuals, who are adulterers, who are thieves, who are liars. Why? Because the whole human race is a race of sinners. And a healthy church has a certain number of 
lost people among them. And then the church has a number of, a very small number, of those who are godly and faithful, and you'd have to kill them to keep them away from Jesus. And then the church has a number of people who are saved people, but they're not living like it. They're hedging their bet. They have faith, but they're not living by faith. Do you understand that? You can seal the deal with Jesus, and yes, you will be eternally saved. The phrase, once saved, always saved, is not in the Bible, but it is a true concept. And the Bible declares it. Jesus says, I give unto them everlasting life, neither shall they perish, but they are transferred from death unto life. And he said, nobody can pluck them out of my hand. And for good measure, he says, and the Father gave them to me, and nobody can pluck them out of my Father's hand. And all God's people said, that's what I'm counting on. My salvation is not based on me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. He alone is the solid. And so in every church where there should be those who live by faith and those who are struggling to live by faith and those who don't even know what faith is. Oh, listen to me. If you're ever in doubt, you say, Preacher, I, I, I don't even know if they know how to behave in church. Give them a try. Give them a try. We used to have some in children's church. They wouldn't behave in church. That's why they were in children's church. And she used to have to sit on them while I tried to preach to them. I'm telling you, we had some that were, well, they, if we had rafters, they would have climbed them. Bring them. Worst thing can happen, we'd have a short disruption and we'd take them home. It's okay. But we need a church full of lost, dying people. Miss Heather, last time I checked, y'all had a lot of sick people in the hospital, didn't you? Yeah, you got a couple of wards there where there's nothing but contagiously sick people. Yeah. Did you know what? You don't have to worry about getting the disease of lost people. You were born with it. And if you're saved, you can never go back to it, you see. Don't be afraid of lost people. Expect them to act like lost people. Expect them to act like they are spiritually dead, totally clueless and out of contact with God. It's because of Ephesians chapter 2 describes them that way exactly. The apostle Paul told the folks in Corinth, and such were some of you. Now you're washed. Now you're sanctified. How do you expect people ever to come to Jesus if they don't come into the fellowship of loving, witnessing, preaching, teaching people? I'm telling you what. We got a little bit of food in store in a freezer. And we got a little food in store in a pantry. We're not hoarders, but you know, if the power goes off, I want to have enough peanut butter to get through the day. You see, I can live off of peanut butter. Man can't live by bread alone. Anyway, I'm. But if it goes a little while, eventually I'm going to have to go to a grocery store or Sam's or somewhere. You go to the place where there's food to have food. May I ask you, where in this community can lost Dying people find the living water, find the bread of life. Now, thank God there's some people out there trying to do their job. I, I love Brother Rob down the street at Grace Missionary Church. I praise God. They're, they're trying to do the business of reach people for Christ. There's a little Calvary Baptist church down here. They're trying to do that too. There's others in this community, a little church of God over here not too far away. They're trying to reach people too. And I don't, I don't want to leave anybody out, but, it, but I, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, there's not, you say, well, that's, that's three or four places. Yeah, you know how many people there live in the five-mile radius of this city that we call Auburn? There's tens of thousands of people. And man, I'm telling you, between Winder and Decula and Auburn, my goodness. <laughs> 
Have you tried to drive down 324 or 124 lately? There's people everywhere. In all these woods, even in Brother Billy's neighborhood, they shoved all those trees down right there on his street. And one, two, three, four, five. How many houses? Boom, 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 boom. People, people, people. Many of them coming from places where they don't have a gospel preaching church on every corner. When we were in Buffalo, New York. We opened up the, uh, yeah, we had telephone books back then and, and opened up the yellow pages looking for a Baptist church. There were two listed. Couldn't get an answer at one of them. And, and, and you know Buffalo, New York is a huge city. It's huge. I couldn't tell you how many uh, Catholic churches there were. Many of them. Episcopal churches, Lutheran churches, no Baptist churches. Now I'm not saying these denominations are anything. I'm just saying I know if you go into a good gospel Baptist church, you're going to get the gospel. <laughs> Out of the two churches, I found one, and we visited it, and it happened to be a mission church, and the preacher was sick that morning, and I preached the, the Sunday morning sermon. It's a good, Brother Lee, carry, a, carry an outline with you everywhere you go. Be ready in season, out of season. What I'm saying is people are moving to this place. By the way, in case you didn't notice that politically, people are moving into this state who don't share your values. And the problem is I don't care about all the values as much as I care about they don't share your hope. They don't share your life. And when the sinking ship of this world goes down, they're going to perish with it. Here's the warning. I better get to it. It's my first point, and we'll get the first point done and move on next week. He says, don't, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. For if we sin willfully, you see his point there. He's connecting it with those who, who, who are, they don't want to go to church. They don't want to be, a, they don't want to hear that preacher. They don't want to hear that Sunday school teacher. For if we sin willfully, verse 26, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. But a fearful looking forward, excuse me, a fearful looking for of judgment and of fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sorer punishment. Can it get any harder than that? Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be worthy, thought worthy, who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So you see, there's the warning. This is to those who refuse. They've heard enough to say, no, I don't want to live by faith. I refuse to live by faith. And the warning there is very clear. If we sin willfully, continuing to despise the truth. Remember, we spoke about this about four weeks ago. Those who despise the truth. And do you understand, this can apply to both the lost and the saved. And now be careful with that, but understand, it, there's an application to both. If he says in verse 38, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. He says, any man, if you are presented with an enlightenment and God's called and God's spoken, and whether you have refused to live by faith or whether you have sealed the deal with Christ, but you've slipped away, God help us, we have so many people that have come through the doors of this church and they've gotten all excited. They're like that rocky soil. There's no depth. But brother, they're quick to respond. They know they need Jesus. They pray a sinner's prayer. I don't know what's in their heart. 
but many of them will come back to church and they'll say, Preacher, I know I was saved then and I've done so terribly. I want to live for Christ now. And many of them hang on and many of them uh, stay on the straight and narrow. I don't know about the rest of them. They're scattered. They're scattered. God says, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in it. What is it that, that, that is required to please God? Without faith. It's impossible to please God. And so the idea that the person who willfully sins is a person who says, I don't care what God thinks. I'm not going to be moved by what God thinks. Matter of fact, I'm not even going to be moved by the fact that there is a God. I'm going to go so deep in denial, I'm actually going to believe there is no God. And may I tell you, I've lived there. I know what that's like. There was a time in my life that I said, there is no God. And I'm telling you, I absolutely believe that. I was the fool that said in his heart, there is no God. And I'll tell you why. Because I didn't want there to be a God. Because I was mad at the God that I thought would allow such terrible things to happen to me. I had a grudge against him. So since I got a grudge against him, I'm just not going to believe in him. I'll make him go away. Well, you don't actually make him go away. You just miss out on all his benefits. And my life downward spiral deeper and deeper and deeper. And like that Coast Guard, just before that kid went under the last time, I like to die four times a year before I got saved. Jesus reached down and said, this is your last chance. You want, you want me? I said, oh, Jesus, if you'd have me, if you'd have me, I want you. Any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure. Now, if you're lost and you, you say, no, I'm not going to believe, look at verse 39. They go unto perdition. That means they pass the point of no return. There are two that are called the son of perdition that I know of in the Bible. One was Judas Iscariot. The other is the Antichrist, that man of perdition. Perdition is just the strongest word in the Greek language for total destruction. And to those who draw back, those who refuse to believe, they go unto perdition. Now, Paul said in the last verse here, we are not of them who go back unto perdition, but to believe unto the saving of the soul. There can be a believer who lives like the devil for a time, and it's not going to be very long. Because you see, the person who refuses to live by faith, you have, you'll, you'll choose to respond in faith and you'll, you'll have an encounter with Jesus and there will be life. But then you draw back. Now you don't draw back unto perdition, but if you happen to read the 12th chapter of this book of Hebrews, it says God spanks his children and he does it for their good. You see, when you get in that condition, God will start the pruning process. Read John chapter 15. Clip, clip, clip. You can only prune back just so far on a branch before they ain't no more branch. You got the vine there, but the branch is gone. Every branch in me that bears no fruit, he takes away. God will chasten, and for the person, the believer that refuses to live by faith, they might die. What does it say in verse 28? He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sorer punishment suppose ye? Now, he talks about them that are going back into perdition, but I tell you what, Paul the apostle said, uh, speaking of one, uh, two men, Hymenaeus and Alexander, he turned them over to Satan that they might be chastened, that they might not learn to blaspheme. You see, God doesn't want us, if it, were, if it were possible to get to the place you could lose your salvation, God's going to take you out before that happens. If it were possible, there are people whose lives are shortened. So you see, there's the warning concerning those who refuse to live by faith. Whether lost or saved, they refuse. 
They say, yeah, I know, but not today. Understand me. If you say no to God, whether it's no, not this week, or whether it's just no, no, absolutely no, I'm not interested, you're still saying no to God. Now, I was going to take some time to talk about what faith means, and I want to talk about who the just are, but let's just close with this idea. Those who are justified in the sight of God are those who live by faith. You will not be justified. Your sins will not be forgiven. Your sins will not be blotted out. Your name will not be written in the book of life unless you are willing to respond to God in faith. And all of the blessings of the kingdom are waiting for you if you are willing to live by faith. You'll not just be justified at the judgment seat, but you'll be justified today. And your prayer will be heard. And your prayer will be answered. And your relationship with the living God will no longer be a text now and then but it'll be face to face like Moses met with God. Let me ask you this morning. Is it possible that in the business of living by faith, your life could improve this morning by a choice that you make today? Could you turn to God as that poor man that was desperate for his child to be healed? He said, Lord, I believe, but will you help me with all of my unbelief? Will you help me with it? Will you help me overcome it? Will you help me to fill in the emptiness and the gap of my unbelief? Let me be that person who lives by faith. Now, the rest of the chapter, and we'll go back to it, Paul talks about being able to overcome so many things and triumph in so many ways if we live by faith. But regardless of what happens, will you make that choice to live by faith today? Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus at all. You've heard the name, but you, you don't understand that he can be real and personal to you. Would you reach out to him and say, Lord, I don't know what to believe about you, but I want to learn about you. I want to know what I need to believe. I need to know what I need to trust in. Maybe you're here today and you already know it. But you got to say, Lord, I haven't been trusting you. I've been trusting in my job and I've been trusting in my friends and I've been trusting in my technology and I've been trusting in my 401k. But I haven't been trusting in you. God, I want to please you. You've been so good to me. Let the goodness of God lead you to repentance.